The National Desk, America's News, now. Bidenomics is about building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up. Breaking down Bidenomics, the first steps in the president's new economic plan and what experts will be watching for in the coming months. The great resignation morphing into regret, why so many are now wanting their past gig. Plus, a farmland ban, the states where foreign companies can't buy U.S. agricultural property and why. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. We're glad you're with us. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following all week. First, landmark ruling. The Supreme Court rejects race-based affirmative action in college admissions. The stark divisions among the justices. The former Parkland school resource officer, who prosecutors said failed to confront a gunman to save lives, acquitted. Hunter Bodden settled a child support case with the mother of his four-year-old daughter. Why he took more than money. And the new report that suggests a piece of America was found on board that Chinese spy balloon. First, to the Supreme Court striking down President Biden's campaign promise of student loan forgiveness. Friday, justices blocked the administration's efforts to deliver up to $20,000 in loan relief to millions of borrowers struggling with debt, a highly divisive proposal from the start. It is not the role of the president or agencies to take on the legislative powers that are reserved to Congress under our Constitution. It's really about reducing the racial wealth gap. If the administration is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, they must use every tool in their tool bit. On the same day, the high court dealt a blow to advocates of LGBTQ rights rooted in free speech grounds. Justices sided with a Christian business owner in Colorado who refuses to create websites to celebrate same-sex weddings. There feels like there's a coordinated attack against the LGBTQ community. There's a lot of disappointment, a lot of sadness about this ruling and decision. It was a six to three decision penned by Justice Neil Gorsuch. He wrote, quote, the First Amendment envisions the United States as a rich and complex place where all persons are free to think and speak as they wish, not as the government demands. Then there's the landmark ruling bringing an end to affirmative action in higher education. The decision is already reverberating across college campuses nationwide. The court's conservative majority striking down affirmative action programs at Harvard University and the University of North Carolina. Programs the institutions argued help diversify their student bodies. But the justices said they violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Students, however, may still address race in admissions essays, expressing how it impacted their lives. Another major headline, days of deliberations ending in an acquittal. We, the jury, find as follows as to the defendant in this case. The defendant is not guilty. The Parkland School Resource Officer official said stayed outside while the gunman opened fire, breaking down in tears. Scott Peterson faced up to life in prison if convicted on all counts, which included felony child neglect, culpable negligence, and perjury. Got my life back. We got our life We've back. We've got our life way. back after four and a half years. The only person to blame was that monster. It wasn't any law enforcement. Nobody on that scene from BSO, Coral Springs. Everybody did the best they could. 17 people died at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High that day. The defense said Peterson didn't confront the shooter because he was confused about where the shots were coming from. New details in the classified documents case against former President Donald Trump. According to the New York Times, a federal jury in Miami is still investigating aspects of the case. In recent days, the jury has subpoenaed a handful of people, but we don't know who those people are or what information the jury is seeking. Prosecutors often continue investigating criminal cases after the defendant is charged, and the findings could result in additional charges. A new poll from AP Newark shows GOP support for the former president dipped following the federal indictment, as you see here, before the classified documents case. 68% of Republicans view Trump favorably. That number dropped 8% after he was indicted. 
Overall, public opinion of Trump didn't change because of the charges, with one third of the public viewing the former president favorably. Hunter Biden has settled a child support case with the mother of his four-year-old daughter for an undisclosed amount of money and Hunter Biden paintings. This is House Republicans requested a voluntary testimony from Justice Department officials who investigated the president's son, who earlier this month reached a plea deal on tax and gun charges. The National Desk, Janae Bowens, explains Hunter Biden's legal turmoil. Were you? No. Earlier this week, President Joe Biden strongly denying he was involved or present when his son Hunter Biden allegedly texted and pressured a Chinese business partner in 2017. This after an IRS whistleblower told lawmakers Justice Department prosecutors denied requests to look into certain messages, allegedly from Hunter Biden. How did we get here? Evidence shows Hunter Biden and his family members were doing business in foreign countries while his father was vice president. Back in 2018, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Delaware started its investigation into the younger Biden for potential violations of tax and money laundering laws. October 2020 was the New York Post story about the contents of his laptop, including financial documents with foreign companies, something that then-candidate Joe Biden called Russian disinformation. February 2021, the Biden administration decided to retain David Weiss, the U.S. attorney for Delaware and a Trump appointee, for the investigation. December 2022 brought the Twitter files. Congressional Republicans have been doing investigations into Hunter Biden's business dealings for years and promised even more action after gaining control of the House. And in May 2023, House Republicans released a report on the Biden family accusing them of receiving millions from foreign entities in exchange for access to powerful government officials. On June 20th, a deal was announced that would likely allow Hunter Biden to avoid serving jail time pending a judge's approval. He agreed to plead guilty next month to two tax misdemeanors and struck a deal with federal prosecutors to resolve a felony gun charge. His attorney said his client's words had no connection to anyone in his family. Critics say it was a sweetheart plea deal. You'd be hard pressed to find cases where other individuals engaged in the same kind of tax evasion ended up only getting misdemeanor charges. Republicans are continuing their investigations into the president and his family. I'm Janae Bowens for the National Desk. Keeping an eye on your money as President Biden makes his sales pitch to Americans. He calls it Bidenomics and points to three key pillars. Smart public investments in America, empowering and educating workers and promoting competition. The president says the strong labor market has put his administration in a position to implement those changes. But critics argue his claims about job creation are exaggerated. For President Biden, 13 million is a magic number. We've created 13.4 million new jobs, more jobs in two years than any president has ever made in four. Looking at raw numbers, this is true, but the majority of those were recovered from job cuts during the pandemic. What hasn't fully recovered is the overall labor force participation rate driven by people over 55. We still have a very high, you know, elevated job openings number. I think a lot of that is because that one population that probably would have been filling those jobs for a couple more years uh, went ahead and retired and, and didn't seem to re-engage after that. There are currently 2 million more people with jobs than there were in February 2020, according to an analysis of Labor Department data by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Though pandemic job recovery played out much faster than the Congressional Budget Office predicted, Republicans argue the president shouldn't get credit for it. Instead, they say workers and businesses are worse off than they were before Biden took office. He's made inflation up by all of his new regulations, He's made it more competitive, less competitive for us. And point to how Americans feel. An AP NORC poll out Wednesday shows just 34% of adults approve of the president's handling of the economy. In the eyes of members of the Federal Reserve, whose top priority is fighting inflation, the labor market is almost too strong. Jobs are being created, there are strong wage gains, and that's driving spending, driving real incomes and driving spending, which is driving more demand and continuing to drive labor markets. And new details on the Chinese spy balloon that floated over the continental U.S. The Wall Street Journal reports it was loaded with American-made equipment. According to a Navy analysis of the debris, it had commercially available U.S. gear that was attached to specialized Chinese sensors. According to the analysis, those were designed to transfer pictures and video. But it doesn't appear any of it was transmitted to China. 
States in the southwest are experiencing the worst drought they've had in 1,200 years, according to experts. And right now, Arizona's attorney general is pursuing restrictions on foreign entities with farmland in the state. The fact check team takes a closer look at state bans on foreign-owned farmland. Some states are limiting or even banning foreign entities as USDA records show that they control about 40 million acres of U.S. farmland. I'm with Courtney from the Fact Check team. Now, we talked about foreign-owned uh, limits in Arizona earlier due to water shortages. What's happening in some other states? At least 22 states already specifically ban or limit foreign businesses, foreign governments, or non-residents from owning or acquiring farmland, like Alabama, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Utah. But more restrictions are making their way through legislation in more than half the states. Yeah, and for varying reasons, uh, including protecting the food supply, for example, even national security, uh, so is the federal government stepping in? There's no federal law right now, but proposals have been introduced in both the House and the Senate, like the PASS Act and the Farm Act. Now, it's unclear if any of them will make it through, but there is bipartisan momentum to restrict foreign farmland purchases, especially China. Yeah, that's right, Courtney, thank you. And for more on this fact-check team topic, including links to their sources, scan the QR code you see on your screen or visit us at thenationaldesk.com. Ahead on the National Desk, major cities overwhelmed. Former Acting Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection, Mark Morgan, joins us to talk about the migrant crisis and the population they just surpassed. Medical experts will analyze presumed human remains found in the wreckage of the Titan submersible. The Coast Guard has convened a Marine Board of Investigation to understand what led to the implosion and to prevent another tragedy. Officials will examine the debris, collect more evidence, interview witnesses and hold a hearing. To a new landmark moment in the migrant crisis, there are now more migrants living in New York City than there are homeless people. The National Desk Jen Jeffcode sat down with former Acting Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection Mark Morgan for a closer look inside the city. So they hit that number this past weekend. 50,000 migrants now living in local city shelters compared to 49,700 homeless people. And Mark, what's really troubling about this is that this is not the number of migrants who've actually arrived in this city this past year. That number is around 80,000, meaning 30,000 have been transported to other cities and states. How much is this costing and how much longer will New York City be able to, to deal with this? Yeah, both good questions, Jan. Look, and here we go again. We hit, we hit yet another historic landmark and not a good one under this administration. <clears throat> and Jan, we talked about this before. Uh, keep in mind, I think for people listening, remember, New York is probably one of the richest cities on the face of the planet. And with 80,000 in their shelters, they're, they're screaming uncle and they're overwhelmed. Let's keep in mind the last 28 months, we've seen over 7.7 .7 million total encounters in Godaways under this administration. So 80,000 compared to millions is really just a drop in the bucket. 
And let's keep in mind, it's not just about New York, although they get most attention. It's not just about illegal aliens in shelters. We know that they're being pushed to, to sponsors. They're living with friends and families. And many of them, we have no idea where they are in the United States, let alone who they are. This is simply unsustainable and it's costing U.S. taxpayers billions of dollars. It also shows the mayor's hypocrisy here when he was upset about so many migrants being bused into his city. Now we know at least 30,000 have been bused out of his city. Oh. Republican Representative Andrew Garabino, though, from Long Island, introduced new legislation to protect unaccompanied minors at the border from trafficking. Tell us about the importance of this act and what it does to keep these children safe. Well, look, I applaud his efforts, but let's keep in mind, Jane, the truth is the only way to really prevent trafficking from happening is to secure our border and de-incentivize uh, illegal immigration from happening. Look, as long as the United States releases unaccompanied minors in the United States who entered illegally, the cartels will continue to exploit that. They're going to continue to smuggle the unaccompanied minors and then thrust them into a life of trafficking uh, afterwards. Again, I applaud his effort, but this is, this is a reactive bill after the crime has happened or is well underway. And let's keep in mind, Secretary Mayorkas, he's already shown that, that, that congressionally passed laws are nothing but, but mere advisory opinions to him. He's not enforcing the laws now that can protect unaccompanied minors. What makes us think that he's actually going to enforce a law then, that a new law that has passed? What we need to do, what Congress should be focusing on, is impeaching Secretary Mayorkas. Mark, FAIR just released a report estimating the number of illegal immigrants in the U.S. Tell me more about these numbers in this report. Yeah, it's a really extensive analysis done, and the crux of it was based on U United States Census data. And they estimated that the number of illegal aliens in this country right now currently is well over 16.8 million. Now, I, I personally think that number is low, but, I, I, but, but I'll, I'll tell you, I think this data is right uh, that they used. And, and the, I, I think we can really stick to 16.8 million is at least the low number and it's a righteous number. And they also, part of the analysis, they said that right now it's costing U.S. taxpayers net cost is almost $170 billion. And they expect at the end of the Biden's first term, that cost to U.S. taxpayers is going to be around $200 billion. And you can view the full interview plus more top stories online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. Going by the numbers now, a new global Gallup poll of more than 120,000 workers found 18% of them are they they are in the process of loud quitting. That's when employees take action that's directly undercut or, or harm a company's goals. Now, the Gallup poll also found nearly 59% of employees are still quiet quitting. But as the National Desk Angela Brown explains, some Americans who left their jobs during the Great Resignation may now be regretting it. The great resignation turning into the great regret. The paycheck survey found 80% of employees who left their jobs during the great resignation regret it. A Harris poll finds nearly one in five workers who quit during the past two years regret it. Career strategist Julie Bauke. People got stars in their eyes around the salaries and didn't think real hard about, is this really a good move for my career? New polling not scaring people off. Government data revealing 3.8 million people quit their jobs in May. A recent LinkedIn study found 61% are considering leaving their jobs in 2023. Staffing recruiters say big hiring bonuses may be gone. We're going to pay you a fair wage, and if you deserve an increase of 3% or 5% or 7%, that maybe we pay that. But we're not going to be handing out 20, 25, 35% uh, increases in base salary to people. I think those days are, are gone for a while. But former workers may be coming back. The survey found 68% of employees say they have attempted to get their old jobs back. The familiarity of going back to where you were is really tempting. But can statement. you go back? That's the question. Sometimes you can. Look, if you were well regarded and the company was sorry to lose you, absolutely. That same survey found only 27% of employers rehired employees. The job market is showing some signs of slowing down, but overall still very strong. Over 10 million jobs open and unemployment at 3.7%. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. Angela, thank you. Coming up next here on the National Desk, America's News Now, AC for All. The former inmate's mission to make sure sweltering Texas heat does not turn state prisons deadly.
The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America, starting in Texas with the push to get air conditioning in all Texas prisons. They are suffering when, right now as we speak because it is hot. Henry Rodriguez, executive director for the San Antonio chapter of LULAC, says he knows the issue all too well because he's lived through temperatures that he says seemed like a form of torture at a Texas state prison. I was there. I was an inmate and it was hot. Now, climate change is real. And it's a lot worse now. A study released by Harvard in November suggests that 13% of inmate deaths between 2001 and 2019 were heat related. That's more than 250 deaths and an average of 14 deaths per year. Both Rodriguez and Texas Senator Jose Menendez say those numbers are unacceptable. When you have prisoners who have nowhere to go, nothing to do, and the correctional officers who are in there, uh, it seems to me like it's a violation of human rights. Menendez says he plans to continue filing bills to help these inmates and hopes that it doesn't come down to federal law changes to improve what he calls dire circumstances. Now over to Maine, asylum seekers staying at the Portland Expo shelter held a demonstration this week. They're protesting the conditions there, saying some have had to sleep on the floor. They've been given expired food and that the sick aren't receiving proper medical attention. The shelter is set to close August 16th, adding to their concerns. What are you going to do in mid-August when this closes? We don't know. That's the problem. Because the general citizens say to us to, like, to look for a house and they will pay. It. And there are a lot of people here that find the house, but when they go there, they don't want to pay. We don't know why. City leaders met with the asylum seekers following the protest and say they're working with them to address their concerns. In Kentucky, the city of Bellevue has renamed a street in honor of Taylor Swift's shows this weekend at Paycor Stadium. This week, Taylor Avenue became Taylor Swift Avenue with the signs lit up in pink. City leaders say they are excited for the economic boost the concerts are bringing to Bellevue. We're less than two miles away from the venue, so it's going to be easier to find somewhere to eat and drink here and then take the South Bank shuttle right over to downtown. And you know, Taylor Swift fans will be very happy about this. According to experts, it is Swift Tour is expected to generate $92 million for the Cincinnati economy. Up next here, front gear failure. The plane full of passengers forced to land without one of its most crucial pieces of equipment. Caught on camera in Fresno, California, kids playing a dangerous game with an approaching Amtrak train. The National Desk, Rich Rodriguez, talked to a parent who saw it all and pleaded with the kids to get off the tracks. School's out and kids will play. But how could anyone be so foolish to mess around on the tracks with a train approaching? Mohammed Ahmad was on an evening walk in northwest Fresno and saw kids playing on the tracks. It's an 
His video from a distance caught a few kids between ages 10 to 12 playing chicken with the train. Like when train passed by and they were like just laughing and like, uh, like they done something very, very, you know, very, very good. They achieved something. After the Amtrak rolled by, Ahmad pleaded with the kids to get down. Just call them like it's not safe up there. You have to come down. Three took his advice and three didn't. They were just trying to like uh, argue with me and they just want to say like uh, uh, we it's professionalism. Uh, we are professionals. So I just tell them it's not professional. It's uh, foolishness, you know. In the video, you see one of the boys doing push-ups as the train gets closer. No one was hurt in this incident. Ahmad is a parent and hopes the video will convince other parents in his neighborhood to keep a closer eye on their children. He knows the train conductor did all he could to prevent a tragedy. The train guy was uh, uh, blowing horn nonstop. It was like nonstop. Rich Rodriguez. The National Transportation Safety Board is investigating this emergency landing. It happened at Charlotte Douglas International Airport after the Delta plane took off from Atlanta. Pictures show the plane you see here with its nose landing gear up. Delta says it's a rare occurrence and the flight crew trains extensively to safely manage situations like this. According to Delta, two pilots, three flight attendants and 96 passengers were on board the Boeing 717 aircraft. Thankfully, no injuries were reported. Passengers on that plane say the pilots and crew were calm and collected. Up next here on the National Desk, America's News Now. A massive scheme revealed how fraudsters may have gotten away with more than $200 billion in small business loans. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. If this was any other person, they likely would have already served their sentence. The IRS whistleblower in the Hunter Biden probe breaking his silence, what he claims went wrong in the agency's investigation. Sucked into a storm drain, the fearless deputy who put his life on the line to save another, now speaking out. And Sweetener's Sting, the new investigation into some of America's favorite treats. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton, and developing right now, the IRS whistleblower who came forward with concerns about how the Justice Department handled Hunter Biden's case is speaking publicly claiming the investigation was slowed down. The National Desk, Kayla Gaskins, has more.
There were IRS agent Gary Shapley standing firm in his stance. The president's son got special treatment during the federal investigation into his tax and gun crimes. Shapley speaking first exclusively to CBS News. If this was any other person, they likely would have already served their sentence. Defending concerns he shared with Congress, including allegations the Justice Department roadblocked parts of their investigation. There were certain investigative steps that we weren't allowed to take that could have led us to President Biden. And you wanted to take him? We needed to take them. In a WhatsApp message from 2017, Hunter Biden making demands from a Chinese associate, mentioning multiple times his dad was there next to him. This associate, Henry Zhao, is a member of the Chinese Communist Party, according to reporting by the New York Post. Reporters continuing to pressure the president on his involvement. Were you sitting there? Mr. Were you involved? Uh, no. The House Oversight Committee releasing another one of Hunter Biden's WhatsApp exchanges from 2017. This one demanding five million dollars a year from an official at a CCP-linked Chinese energy company. The first son writing, "The Bidens are the best I know at doing exactly what the chairman wants from this partnership." The committee identifying the chairman as a Chinese billionaire whose stated goal is expanding China's reach and influence around the world. Republicans pointing to the IRS whistleblower as further proof the DOJ protects the Bidens. This is public corruption. The District of Delaware still declining to comment. The Justice Department referring us to Merrick Garland's press conference last Friday. We make our cases based on the facts and the law. Garland will appear before the House September 20th. He'll likely face tough questions from Republicans threatening impeachment. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins. Kayla, thank you. Hoping to turn the tables, former President Donald Trump is countersuing the woman who won a defamation suit against him. Trump says magazine columnist E. Jean Carroll defamed him when she appeared on CNN and said he raped her. She made the comment the day after a jury found Trump defamed and sexually abused Carroll. The jury awarded Carroll $5 million of damages. Trump is appealing that verdict. A new NBC poll shows a majority of Republican voters would vote for former President Donald Trump in the Republican primary. 51 percent list him as their top choice. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis comes in second with 22 percent of the votes. Former Vice President Mike Pence rounds out the top three with 7 percent. Former Vice President Mike Pence makes a surprise trip to Ukraine, projecting solidarity against Russia. He met with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky at the presidential palace earlier this week, paid his respects to fallen soldiers at a memorial, and visited children at a youth center. The 2024 Republican presidential candidate is reiterating his strong resolve to support Ukraine during the fight. We'll continue to do everything in our power to make sure that we provide the Ukrainian military with the support they need until they repel the Russian invasion and restore the sovereignty of this country. This is the first time Pence has been in the country since the war started. The National Transportation Safety Board has released a preliminary report on the collapse of a section of I-95 in Philadelphia. Then TSB's investigation has so far found the driver of the tanker truck hauling gasoline lost control on a curved off ramp, causing the truck to flip and catch fire, killing the driver and leading to the collapse of the elevated section of the interstate. The investigation into the crash and collapse continues. We're hearing from the Florida Sheriff's deputy who was sucked into a storm drain while trying to save a man during severe flooding. Deputy William Hollingsworth spoke with our station in Pensacola recounting that day. He spent 30 seconds underwater being carried more than 100 feet underneath four lanes of a divided highway. He said the whole time he was thinking of his family. I thought this could be it. Of course, I thought about my family, um, mainly how I might not see them again, and um, just how much I was going to miss them and um, how much they would miss me. I can only imagine. He said he focused on trying to stay as calm as possible. The man he was trying to save also survived. So glad they are okay. Right now, there is some disbelief from around the world for the millions spent on the recovery efforts for that Titan tourist sub. 
The National Desk Jan Jeffcoat sat down with Washington insider Armstrong Williams in Greece, not far from the site where hundreds of migrants were killed when their ship sank. Armstrong, you hardly even heard about this shipwreck that happened there off the coast of Greece. What do you make uh, of this, a, a tale of two tragedies? Well, Jen, it is a tale of two boats. You have to keep in mind that the migrants that, that were coming from Syria, the destination of Italy, was coming through um, the Greek water, and they knew the risk that they were taking, and they were willing to take that risk, something different than what we see in the United States at our border. But I, th I think the issue here is, well, um, there was a lot of chaos on the boat. Um, there was a lot of infighting and a lot of anger. They believed that when the Greek authorities tried to tow them in, it caused the boat to capsize. I mean, there's so many narratives going on here, Jim. But I think when you think about the resources, the fact that the Canadian government in the United States Navy knew um, that the five people were already dead on Sunday, even though they were continue the story until later on that week, those resources were being used. And I think that's the issue here, is that where do we prioritize? I mean, think about this, Jim. This is just really, five people were lost in the submissible. Think about this. While they say that 104 people died at sea here off the coast of Greece, guess what? There are close to 700 people on that vessel and 600 are unaccounted for under the water. Mm. And this happened on June 14th. And if they're not accounted for Jan, Jan, it means they're dead. Where's the outrage? Where are the resources? And I think that's what they believe. There's, it's a class issue. It's an issue of haves and haves not. Because you got five people you cannot find, and now Biden is talking about using the NTSB to recover the records, records, even though we know nobody is going to be. But yet you have 600 people off the coast of Greece. Right. Lives lost, families devastated. And the big question when you talk about how they're going to recover some of that, some of that stuff in the water there, you, you look at the money that is expected to be spent. We're talking millions and from where taxpayer dollars. And there's a lot of outrage as a result of that as well when you, when you talk about uh, the wreckage. After a very chaotic weekend in, in Russia, uh, Armstrong President Vladimir Putin in a very vulnerable state right now. Could he lose power? What's your thoughts? You know, uh, the uh, mercenary the businessman in Russia is a very, very close ally of Putin. And, you know, Putin advocated using the mercenaries early on in the conflict with Ukraine. But they believe that the generals uh, are lying and misleading. Uh, uh, they have no justification for invading Ukraine in the first place. It could have been resolved with bloodshed. They think it's devastating the economy. And so they decided to turn on Putin, the very mercenaries that he decided uh, and obviously Putin has condemned it. He labeled this as treason, and there are there are warrants out for their arrest. There, in fact, not just warrants. There, 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 there are bodies out for their heads. But this guy feels as though that he has the moral high ground. That what is happening in Ukraine is just it's just so immoral. It's so disgusting. That it happens every day, and that people are being lied to. And so he's decided to take on Putin. It does weaken Putin. Putin is already talking about his options if he had to go to exile. One of the few places that probably would accept them would be Venezuela because we have no idea where this may be. We do know today that Vladimir Putin is very vulnerable. And you can view the full interview plus more top stories online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. Officials say the Justice Department is taking action against dozens of people for defrauding Medicare and Medicaid. The two-week enforcement effort resulted in federal and state charges against 78 defendants, including... Two dozen doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals. Officials say the scheme spanned 16 states and resulted in $2.5 billion of alleged fraud. Now, pandemic fraudulent funds. A report estimates fraudsters may have gotten away with more than $200 billion in small business loans. The National Desk, Janae Bowens, explains and shares what's being done about it. Small business owners like Winnie Thompson are still picking up the pieces from the COVID-19 pandemic's major blow. Packages were getting lost and people were getting really upset. Um, and so we had to refund thousands of dollars um, that we really couldn't afford. Her literacy company, Books and Bros, didn't get government aid. So COVID-19 business loan fraud strikes a nerve. There are businesses, you know, in addition to us who have, you know, been in dire need of support. 
A new report from the Small Business Administration's Office of Inspector General shows more than $200 billion in COVID-19 aid, like PPP loans, may have been stolen. But the Small Business Administration disagrees and says the amount of likely fraud is $36 billion. Either way, money ended up in the wrong hands, despite several warnings. Three years ago, we were operating blindly. Dane Stangler with the Bipartisan Policy Center says there's no excuse for the fraud, but context is needed. We were trying to get as much money out the door to small businesses as possible. The SBA OIG's report says the SBA weakened or removed necessary controls to prevent fraudsters. It is very frustrating. The federal watchdog admits the SBA has made progress, but there's still room for improvement, like establishing and using effective internal fraud controls. The SBA Inspector General Mike Ware will testify to Congress about the findings on July 13th. Reporting for the National Desk, I'm Janae Bowens. School's out for the summer, and the nation's report card's most recent results revealed low test scores for reading and math. School choice is touted by some as a solution by allowing parents to use public money to send kids to a private school. This week, the fact check team dug into the policy state by state. At least eight states have enacted school choice bills in the first half of 2023. I'm with Courtney from the Fact Check team. And with that in mind, Courtney, how many states are there total now? Scott, according to Ed Choice, as of last year, 32 states plus Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico give parents some kind of choice when it comes to where they send their kids to school. All right, so looking at voucher programs specifically, you looked at kind of a state-by-state -state protocol. What did you find there? So Florida recently became the fourth state this year to enact a law allowing parents to get taxpayer-funded vouchers to send their kids to private school, right behind Iowa, Utah, and Arkansas. And at least 18 other states have introduced similar bills. All right, so give us an example of how one of these laws really works. Sure, let's look at Iowa. The law called the Students First Act gives state funding for students to attend private school. Starting in 2025, all students will qualify to get nearly $8,000, but for now, the state has household income requirements. All right, thank you so much for your research on this. And for more on this fact check team topic, including links to their sources, scan the QR code on your screen or visit thenationaldesk.com. Thank you both. Four NFL players are suspended for gambling violations. Three of them will have to sit out the entire 2023 season. The NFL says Isaiah Rogers and Rashawn Berry of the Colts, along with free agent Demetrius Taylor, were suspended for the entire 2023 season for betting on NFL games. Tennessee Titans tackle and Nicholas Petit Frere is suspended for six games for placing a non-NFL bet at a team facility. So to come here, our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington from affirmative action struck down by the Supreme Court to the nation's top GOP presidential candidates all in one place. It's coming up next.
And welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. The Bureau's correspondents are here with their insights and the stories they've been covering. The Supreme Court weighing in on affirmative action, striking down the use of race as a factor for college and university admissions. National correspondent Atra Elnishar, what's the reaction? Well, for the petitioner, students for fair admissions and their supporters in these dual cases against Harvard and the University of North Carolina, it's certainly a win. They argued that the schools, the two schools' consideration of race discriminated against white and Asian students. Uh, but opponents of the decision uh, say that it sets racial equality in this country back. They point to states like California, where there are already bans on affirmative action in college admissions uh, that have coincided with steep drops in racial diversity on campus. So the president already instructing uh, the Department of Education to examine policies that, uh, that foster inclusion and those that work against it, for example, legacy admissions. And Autra, do we have a sense of what this will look like in practice moving forward? Well, there's almost certain to be more litigation on this because the majority opinion uh, did not completely strike down the use of race and admissions altogether. What it does is make it much more narrow, uh, and I should note, exempts military academies. So what the conservative majority decided is that the schools in this case, Harvard and UNC, which many schools uh, model their uh, admissions processes off of, uh, violated the 14th Amendment because in their consideration of race, the majority opinion says that the admissions did not offer so-called measurable objectives. So now moving forward, uh, a school has to have a concrete goal, though the court didn't specify what those goals have to be when they consider race, uh, and come with a quote unquote logical endpoint. Also, students can still talk about race in their essays, for example, uh, and a legal, legal expert I spoke to says this really opens up any entity that receives public funding to scrutiny in their consideration of race. Perhaps a research lab that's got a diversity hiring initiative. So again, this is not the end of this issue in the courts. Right, the debate not over on this controversial issue. Kayla Gaskins is in Philadelphia where the conservative Moms for Liberty held a summit this past week featuring several Republican presidential candidates. Kayla, what are the key issues that came up at the summit? <laughs> education, of course, because that's what this summit has been all about. And that's what brought all of these candidates here to prove they are the candidate that is going to deliver on this issue. Most of the people we spoke to this, we should, this weekend place education and more specifically parental rights in education as their top issue heading into the 2024 election. I spoke to some people that are here from Florida. They say Ron DeSantis is the best on this issue, which would make sense coming from Ron DeSantis territory there down south. But this weekend, we also heard from Donald Trump. We heard from Vivek Ramaswamy, as well as from Nikki Haley and Asia Hutchinson. Hutchinson. All of them knowing that it is important to come over and win this voting block here. And this group has really expanded in the past two years. They have uh, like 285 chapters in 45 states. They're really making their mark here on the Republican Party. And we'll see if the candidates uh, won any extra people over this weekend. Steve? Kayla, thank you for your hard work. Thanks for your coverage in Philadelphia. And Audra Alnishar, thank you as well. Back to you. Thank you all. Still ahead here on the National Desk, power problems, how the heat wave has Texas working overtime to make sure its grid holds up.
This is the National Desk America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. From West Virginia distributing an opioid settlement to Texas tackling its power grid concerns. We're taking the pulse of America, but we start with a tribute for a fallen Virginia police officer. Chris knew the risks, and he made the conscious decision to do something anyway. A day filled with emotion for the family of Officer Chris Wagner, his immediate family, and his family in blue. A hero never dies, but lives on in our memories. His father, Mark, says that being an officer meant everything to Chris. He loved the job. He knew the job. He understood it. Chief Dennis Russell says the outpouring of support has been overwhelming, especially when he received an unexpected phone call. Chief, this is Governor Young. Governors don't call me. I'm a small town police chief in a small town. But he did. And that really meant, meant a lot to me. One step at a time, one thing at a time. That's how we'll all get through this. So let's get to it. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey outlined the next steps in the distribution of opioid settlements to the state's counties and cities. West Virginia is getting about a billion dollars in settlements and judgments with the drug industry, but not at once. The West Virginia First Foundation gets 72.5%. 24.5% will be allocated to local governments, and 3% will be held in escrow by the state. The idea seems to focus the foundation on prevention and treatment, but the appointing system is not immune to political influence. We have to do it better than what we saw with tobacco and what we saw with some of the past uh, distribution of opioid funds, and this is why we all came to this agreement about how this structure could work. Some settlements stretch over years, and the first arrival of the money is still pending. I think that with the board being sat this summer, we're looking at uh, probably toward the end of the year where I think money could actually be uh, distributed, but a lot of it's up to the court. Records broken with more on the way as more Texans are demanding more energy in a massive heat wave. We already set a new record demand over the weekend. We're expecting another record later this week because of the, of, of the increasing demand on the grid. It's really stressing the grid. Generally, the legislature passed two major grid bills this session. One simply let the Public Utilities Commission and ERCOT continue existing. The other major policy requires approval from Texas voters and would allow state funds to go toward energy infrastructure. But polling shows most voters are not confident in what lawmakers have done to improve the grid. Something bad happens, then we try to fix it as opposed to trying to get ahead of our grid problem because getting ahead of the problems means costing a lot of taxpayer money. And we've got this heat wave, which is gonna make June 2023 the hottest on record in Texas. Um, and our, our electric bills are going up because we're having to run those air conditioners more and more. Still ahead here, the stories making headlines next week. Plus, the World Health Organization will soon release a report that could link an artificial sweetener to cancer. The product's now being linked.
Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week, an arraignment scheduled in federal court in Miami for Trump's co-defendant in the documents case has been rescheduled to next week. Walt Nada was expected to plead not guilty, but court documents show it was postponed because his flight from New Jersey was canceled. His out-of-state attorney also told the magistrate that he hadn't been able to find a local attorney to represent him as required. Prosecutors say Nada helped Trump move the documents and then lied to the FBI. Actor Kevin Spacey was in a London courtroom this week making his first appearance in what expected to be a weeks-long trial for a dozen sexual assault charges. The alleged assaults took place from 2001 to 2013 involving four men who are now in their 30s and 40s. If convicted, Spacey could face life in prison. He's pleading not guilty on all charges. And in the U.S. trial of Joran van der Sloot, the judge's national court proceedings are now being delayed following a request from his public defender. Van der Sloot is accused of extorting money from the family of Natalie Holloway, who disappeared during a 2005 high school graduation trip to Aruba. Investigators say Holloway was last seen with van der Sloot and two others. He pleaded not guilty earlier this month. The artificial sweetener used in Diet Coke and thousands of other products is set to be declared as a possible carcinogen next month by the World Health Organization. According to Reuters, the World Health Organization's cancer agency is conducting a review of aspartame, declaring it a possible carcinogen means there's some limited evidence linking aspartame to cancer. The food industry argues the research has been discredited. That's going to do it for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Check your local listings, and you can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend, a wonderful fourth, and we'll see you back here next week.